Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures. Dear friends, as you know that we have started a series on basic sociology and today we are conducting yet another lecture in the same series. In today's lecture, we will be discussing about critical theory. In the first half of the lecture, we will discuss the overview of critical theory, its context and its features. To discuss this topic, we have with us a subject expert, Professor Maitri Chaudhary. Professor Maitri Chaudhary is professor in School of Social Sciences, JNU. Without further ado, I would like to welcome ma'am to our studios and request her to start the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon and uh, we meet after some time. Today, as uh, you've been already told, we are going to focus on critical theory and Frankfurt School. Uh, as you are aware uh, from the first lecture that I sort of gave on the emergence of sociology in the 19th century classical thinkers, I have put a lot of emphasis on the context within which theories arise. And the same will hold true of the Frankfurt School or in other words what the Frankfurt School is also known as the critical theorists or the critical theory perspectives. But before I go into the context, maybe uh, a certain kinds of lines, a few lines on what this Frankfurt School is. The Frankfurt School is also known as the Institute of Social Research. It was based in Frankfurt in Germany and was founded in a certain sense in 1933 uh, where uh, in there, but after that it was uh, closed down. It was founded in 1923, I'm sorry, but was closed down in 1933, with the rise of the Nazis, which did not allow this institute to function further. And therefore, many of these theorists had to flee to the United States of America, where they found refuge, and continued to explore questions uh, which were uh, very central to them. Um, and before I again de develop on what this context is, perhaps naming who these theorists would would help you to flag off uh, exactly who these people were. There was Marx Hokeimer, 1895 to 1973. There was Theodore Adorno, 1903 to 1969. Herbert Marcuse, 1898 to 1979. Benjamin, 1892 to 1940. Eric Fromm, 1900 to 1980. As you can see, the dates are important, not because you have to learn them by heart, but the dates are important because they indicate that these theories belong primarily to the 20th century. Most of their works are, in fact, not just in the early part of the 20th century, but are relevant for the latter part or the middle part of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Does that mean that these thinkers break away completely from the earlier theorists that we have discussed, particularly the macro sociologists of Marx, Weber, Durkheim? One would like to argue that that is not so because most theories borrow from earlier theories and most theories rest upon certain features which have dominated modern uh, societies right from the 18th, 19th century into the 21st century. Though they acquire new forms, new salience, new visibilities at different periods of time. So the relevance of a capitalism, relevance of an industrial society, the relevance of a mass society remain just as the relevance of democracy or the relevance of the challenges to democracy by authoritarian regimes remain. I flag off these two questions because they're very, very central to the thinkers or the critical thinkers, the, crit uh, the critical theorists. There are two basic contexts which are important to understand why the critical theorists theorize the manner in which they did. One, and both the, the both the contexts are, of course, historical. The first is the political, social, and cultural context which they faced in Germany with the rise of totalitarianism, with the rise of Nazism. When they started asking questions about what is it that prompts people to accept authoritarian regimes? What is it which makes people so readily agree to totalitarianism? not just questions of power and coercion, 
or force and fear, but also why people actually believe that these regimes are good for society. This in turn, this engagement with the willingness of a large section of people to go by authoritarianism prompted them to explore something which was different from the 19th century reformer, 19th century thinkers, that is uh, debates with Freud, psychoanalysis and the possibilities of a delving into psychoanalysis into understand the totalitarian mind or to understand why so people so readily agree to be dominated. You know. So that is in some sense a certain break, a certain diversion. They were also interested not just with the rise of totalitarianism, but what they were interested is in certain developments which took place in West Europe in particular, in the United States of America after the World Wars, particularly World War II, which became a period of great affluence, great deal of prosperity, which made them rethink that did has society changed so fundamentally? The questions that were raised in the 19th century by a Marx, were they relevant in a society which had become so affluent? Were people more free in a society where people apparently seem to have all the good, the good things of life in terms of consumption, livelihood, lifestyle? So they were started getting interested in broader questions about what is freedom? What is individual autonomy? What is individual sovereignty? What is individual choice? So these were the two contexts. One, totalitarian regime. The second, the rise of an affluent society and people's willingness to go by a consumerism and live their lives by, in a certain sense, by just what the goods were being offered to them and not delving into more critical questions or philosophical questions. They were, in a certain sense, interested, therefore, with these two broad ideas of consent and coercion. What do I mean by these two words, consent and coercion? In any society, there are two ways by which people could be dominated. One by sheer force that is coercion, by fear, by sanction, by punishment. The other is by consent where many people and most people are willing to accept that regime, that fear or force as something which is probably good for society. And the argument which we'll develop greater in the next part of our lecture when we discuss Adorno is that the development of the culture industry was very, very important. The development of the media industry was very, very important to create a culture of consent, to a, create a culture where people didn't see any reason why they should rebel, why they should question, or why should they dissect. These kind of grappling with the ideas also led them to ask questions about theory and ask questions about what kind of thought or what kind of theory is necessary in society. At this point, I want to make a certain distinction between critical theory, that is the kind of theory that they were trying to articulate, and the kind of theory or ideas or thoughts which people naturally believed in society. Now, the critical theorists, particularly Adorno and Horkheimer, when they started developing this question, they started feeling that even within our education, even within social sciences, even within those sectors where we ought to think critically, ought to look at certain issues from diverse perspectives, we are increasingly looking at it in a one-dimensional fashion. We are not looking at any kind of knowledge in the manner that we ought to be in uh, by looking at the context with which, within which knowledge emerges, knowledge develops, and knowledge has certain kind of contradictions. Before I dwell on this question of what they meant by critical theory, what they meant by theory, it is perhaps necessary to go back just for a minute to a certain understanding within Marxism. Why do I bring in Marxism here? 
The reason I bring in Marxism is here is because the Frankfurt School or the critical theorists began with an understanding to look into Marxist theory and develop Marxist theory not in the 19th century context within which it emerged of great poverty and disparity, but in the 20th century of great affluence in much of Western Europe and ask, has those questions of freedom relevant in a society such as this? So it is important, therefore, to go back to a key concept of Marxism. And that concept is the concept of consciousness, one, and the concept of ideology, which is linked to it. If you recall, when we were discussing Marx, we made this distinction between what was a certain kind of approach, which was called the idealist approach or the idealist perspective, which looks at consciousness as something which is given and from which we have to understand society as compared to an understanding which is a materialist understanding of consciousness, that consciousness is actually historically, socially constituted, differing in different periods of time. In one, the first, the idealist concept of consciousness, we begin with the ideas that we have about people or society. That is, we do not go into the actual empirical, real conditions, but we look into, we move, we proceed uncritically with the ideas that we have about a particular phenomena. It could be about another culture, another religion. It could be about another society. It could be about family. We don't go and empirically investigate into what families are about, but we go with normative or the cultural ideas which exist in society. The critical theorists, borrowing from that, would then try to emphasize that that approach would be fallacious, it would be basically uncritical, and it is important, therefore, to look into the historical constitution of theory. Adorno and Horkheimer, in fact, argues that there is no such thing as pure thought. There is no such thing as pure thought. Theory is a social, historical form of activity. It differs in different kinds of society, in different historical periods. Perhaps a very quick example would help you to understand what they were trying to say. For example, in the kind of society we live in, it is natural for us to be competitive. All of you who are listening to me today are driven by the need to achieve, to compete, to gain, to acquire your goals or your life goals. Competition in such a society is natural. Now, if we look at it from an uncritical perspective or an idealist perspective, we will analyze society from the category of competition being natural. We will say, yes, you must compete more and you must compete better. Only then you will achieve. Only those who work very hard and compete will succeed. A critical perspective, on the other hand, will look at things historically and say competition was never always natural. And I'll give you a very small example and a real example where this uh, historicity of competition comes alive, that there was a teacher who went to teach in a very uh, you know, remote, uh, what could be called a tribal society, and the teacher wanted to befriend the students before she started teaching. And she said, why don't you line up? They told the children that why don't you line up in two lines and then you run. And whoever wins, I will give you a chocolate. The children didn't seem to be particularly excited by her offer, which she thought they should be. And instead, they looked very depressed and some of them started crying. So she asked, what happened? Why are you distressed? Why are you crying? And they said, but this is a very cruel game. Why can't we all just sit and share the chocolate without racing? This example shows to you that competition, which we feel is ahistorical, across society, natural to human beings, 
could actually be something which is socially constructed. That sharing, in fact, could be something which is natural in particular societies and perhaps a virtue, but in another society it may not be. Very often we see students who were unwilling to share their class notes because they feel if they share their class notes, their competitive edge will be diminished. Through this particular critical kind of perspective, they try to say that, look, thought, consciousness, ideas are socially constructed. Following from this, the critical theorists make a distinction between what they say is identity thinking and dialectical thinking. What do we mean by identity thinking and dialectical thinking? Identity thinking, uh, you know, they argue, it says what something comes under, what it exemplifies, what it represents, what accordingly it is not. And they are arguing that this kind of identity thinking by which you classify things or catalog things are very good for administration, for bureaucracies, where you say, let us have certain kinds of categories. Maybe we should have BPLs, maybe people who are below poverty line, maybe people who are above poverty line. It could be caste it could be race, it could be various other kinds of categories. And they say it is very useful if we have to manage large population, maybe in terms of certain kind of policy formulation. But what happens here is that in an uncritical thinking, we take these categories as given and fixed. I'll give you an example which will show to you that these categories which may appear very natural in one society may not be so natural in another society. I recall that as an Indian, say when you travel to the United States of America, you there may be classified as an Asian Indian American which is a category which we in India would find unfamiliar with. They use it because that's a category that makes sense to the American state administration where they use the term Asian Indian Americans to distinguish these Asian Indian Americans from the American Indians, which are the original inhabitants of the United States of America. They also use it to distinguish them from Asian Americans who may have come from Southeast Asia. So that's a category which has been established at a particular point of time. Very often in our education today, we take those categories therefore as given. We don't go into the making and unmaking, which is very central to dialectical thinking as against identity thinking. Identity thinking has categories, but what happens is the process by which these categories have been constituted becomes invisible. I give you the example of race. We can take the example of caste in India. Caste existed in India and continues to exist as all of you are familiar. But the manner in which got caste got categorized emerged during the British period of classification. And you can see the arbitrary nature of this classification that the same community of people who may be classified as scheduled caste in one state of the country may be classified as scheduled tribe in another and in some cases as even OBC, which shows the human construction of these categories. Unfortunately, in the uncritical or the identity way of thinking, we don't look into the processual aspect of the making of category. As against this identity thinking, we have what the critical theorists call dialectical thinking, that it seeks to say what something is, not what we think it is, but what something is. And it tries to capture the kind of contradiction in which things exist. In the identity form of thinking, in the uncritical form of thinking, we look at contradiction as something which is embarrassing. We look at contradictions as something which is a kind of shortfall or a weakness of maybe sociology. For example, very often I have seen debates taking place between sociological thinking and natural science thinking and they say, look, we are not so precise, uh, we, are, we are not so exact and if we are not so exact, we somehow are lesser or lag behind natural science categorization. 
this is erroneous because society is contradictory. As long as society has contradictions, our categories will have contradictions. So dialectical thinking will not look into these contradictions as embarrassment. What they will look at is the very strength. I'll give you a very simple example from a very old text of our country written in 1905 by Rokia Begum, Sultana's Dream. And in that dream, which is just 12 pages, if any of you are interested, look at the internet, Google, and you will have this absolutely wonderful story or a parable where she describes this woman who is in a dream. And they say that they see that the, in that society, the men happen to be in parda and the women happen to be looking after society. And she asks this question, why is this so? And the answer given is that if men are on the street, it becomes very dangerous. So it is better to keep them inside the home. The other perspective would be, which is perspective which in societies like ours, when we have to advise our daughters, don't go out into the streets because the streets are dangerous and therefore the onus of being safe is that you stay away from the streets. Whereas in the onus given in the other of Rokia's volume is that, look, if you keep the men inside, then the streets are safe. What do I show by this example? I show that perspectives are different. Why are the perspectives different? Because in society, different groups of people exist. For some people, they will say that, look, it is natural for men to harass. So the best way is to keep women out of the streets. Whereas the other perspective would argue that if you men don't learn how to respect women, it's better they stay out of the streets. The idea in social or critical thinking is not to abolish this contradiction or this difference of opinion, but to actually have a dialogue or a particular kind of debate to enrich what critical thinking is. I hope I've been able to communicate the basic distinction between identity thinking and dialectical thinking and why the critical theorists, in a certain sense, are called critical theorists. The other aspect that they were trying to look into, Adorno as well as Hokaima, they had this big text called Dialectical, a Dialectic of Enlightenment. As you are aware, in our first lecture, we discussed how enlightenment uh, had impacted the growth of sociology. And they say that, look, we don't want to look at enlightenment at a particular period or a particular time in our history. What we want to look at is what is the purpose of enlightenment. And they have three things that they emphasize, demythologizing, secularizing, and disenchanting. What do I mean by that? It means that, that traditionally people may have had myths to understand society, myths to explore society, and then you had the rise of science or reason to understand society. And Adorno and Hokaima are a little disappointed that with modernity and affluence, we reach a point where we go back that science becomes a myth, technology becomes a myth, instead of science allowing us to critically examine, we start seeing it as something which is given. Two quick examples will make the point. One example is something which Herbert Marcuse in One Dimensional Man makes. That is, for example, if you have this question, what is length? What is length? The answer has to be philosophical in the sense of what is length. It would not be enough to say measure length. And their fear of the critical theorists is that we don't ask fundamental questions any longer. What we do is that if we can operationalize, if we can measure, that seems to be the answer to our questions. You can see it very often in sociological research where maybe you do not go into understanding what is it that we are studying. If you're studying gender, or we're studying caste or agrarian relations, we are more interested in the technique of measurement. How many people will you sample? How many people will you interview? What kind of data will you gather? The operationalization becomes more central and the operationalization is made into kind of an abstract technology without engaging in a critical understanding of what exactly are these categories and how are these categories constituted in society by human people. And they say that this failure for looking into this question of how uh, you know, these categories are emerged leads to a certain invisibility or erasure of 
questions which are foundational for any kind of critical social sciences. That we are only interested in operationalization and we feel that we have a lot of data and we've had certain kind of techniques, maybe some char bar charts and pie charts. Our thinking is over. We do not have to ask that how did I define that? And definitions, again, are not fixed. And therefore, the importance to have examples when we understand a particular phenomena, because it is only through those examples that we are going to be able to understand uh, certain kinds of categories which exist in society. Now, uh, you know, this, the first part that I was sort of talking about is the whole question of the critical theorist perspective and why the critical theorists felt that it was necessary for them to go into the idea of looking and destabilizing or challenging the taken for granted that we can't just mechanically understand. This is particularly true in our country when we do sociology, when you look at guidebooks, when you look at the kind of questions papers which are set and you say define this and you assume that you can only define something in one dimensional fashion. But in fact, the whole question of the critical perspective is to capture the contradictions which are inherent in society and which therefore get reflected in the concepts which are articulated. I'll stop at this point of time and we'll shortly return to discuss the other aspect of the critical theorists. Thank you. Dear friends, in this part of the lecture, we have attempted to understand the overview of critical theory, its context and its features. On that note, we're going to take a break and after the break, we will be resuming with our lecture. Thank you for watching.
Hello friends, welcome to CEC live lectures. Dear friends, in this lecture on critical theory, so far we have done overview, context and features of critical theory. And in this part of the lecture, we will discuss about the con uh, concept of consumer mass society as well as culture industry. To, dis to discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Professor Maitri Chaudhary. And let's welcome Professor Chaudhary and ask her to resume the lecture. Welcome ma'am. Thanks. So we sort of continue now and uh, now that you have a sense overall about the context within which critical theories emerged as well as their focus on critical thinking and why it was different from uh, what is called the identity thinking or looking at it as catalog, uh, you know, catalogs which are uh, given or a listing or measurement. Today, now right now I'm sort of going to focus on one particular text uh, because this text in a certain sense captures the other aspect of the critical theorist, the whole emphasis on, uh, you know, the culture industry and the particular um, work of uh, Theodore Adorno and Max Horkheimer is called the culture industry, enlightenment as mass deception. Now, uh, maybe two point, two lines on um, this very interesting title, the culture industry, enlightenment as mass deception. What do you notice over here? Now, if you're sort of tuned into what a critical perspective is and what a dialectical perspective is, you will see that they have posited uh, two very contrasting uh, or polar opposites together. Culture industry because very often we think culture is natural. This is our culture. This is something which is natural to us. It's intrinsic to us. It is a taken for granted. And when we think of something like an industry, we think about an industry which is a kind of infra a big infrastructure, organized, planned, mass production. Whereas culture is supposed to be something which is natural to us and something which is very unique. When you say, oh, that person is very particular, uh, cultured, uh, you say that there's something which is creative about that aspect. But when you put culture and industry together, you have a situation where something which ought to be creative seems suddenly very organized and mass produced. The second part of the title is enlightenment as mass deception. Because again, you have a contradiction that you apparently we seem to be much more educated than we are before. We are more enlightened. And yet very often we may seem to miss the boat. We may seem to miss, uh, you know, the something which is fundamental to society, which should be obvious to us. We may miss the, you know, the trees for the forest, we may you know, not look into uh, the entire larger context, may not be able to see things from the other person's perspective, maybe in a certain sense believe whatever the media tells us, that is enlightenment as mass deception, that at one hand you are more informed, more uh, you know, flooded with data, uh, flooded with information, and yet at the same time uh, you may be knowing less about the society in which we live in. Now, in this particular culture industry, the first point that I'm going to look in is this anomaly about culture and industry. And here I'm sort of trying to distinguish between two kinds of culture. One is uh, uh, something which I borrow from Gellner, the idea of a garden culture and the other of wild culture. What do I mean? Uh, maybe an example from nature would tell you that when you look at wild forests, when you look at the wilderness and you look at the trees and you look at the many trees, many kinds of leaves, it is natural, it is very beautiful and there seems to be something which is spontaneous about it. This is wild. Whereas when you look at a manicured garden, lawns, particular rows of flower pots, lawns which are mowed carefully, one kind of flowers growing in one kind of bed, that is a garden culture, something where there has been human intervention and that human intervention has to be constantly produced and reproduced. Supposing you don't mow your lawn, your lawn starts getting wild. If you do not weed your um, flower beds, your flower beds will have other kinds of things in between. It will look unkempt, it will look disorganized and not pleasing to the eye, you know. 
So this distinction between garden culture and wild culture is important when we discuss uh, culture industry because what happens with modernity or mass production is that the, in the culture, instead of being something which is our everyday lived life, becomes an industry. What we use, what we produce, what we aspire is decided by, in a certain sense, the industry itself. Culture, a lot of people will say, oh, look, you know, there's no culture today. But actually, what the critical theorist and Adorno in this case is saying, that culture is everywhere. Culture impresses the same stating stamp on everything. All of us are becoming more cultured as well as more same. That is, we are more and more homogeneous. What the kind of clothes which we wear are more and more similar. When I was very, very young, and we, if we went to another town or another state, maybe where some of our relatives lived, the children who are our age dressed very differently. They spoke very differently. The language they used was very different. But today, if in our country, wherever you go, it could be the southernmost part of our country, the northeasternmost or the westernmost part of our country, young people will be roughly wearing similar kinds of clothes. They will all have a smartphone with them. They'll have a certain kind of body language that the way we... Now, this is what they mean by the culture industry, that, that we are increasingly homogeneous. Industry is making our culture certainly homogeneous. It is something which is pervasive, not just in the clothes which we wear, maybe what we eat in our breakfast, what we eat in our lunch, maybe the way we organize our birthdays, maybe the way we organize our weddings. There is an entire culture industry. Unfortunately, however, because the kind, the way which we study or the way which we look at theory, it, we become oblivious to that fact. So again, when we want to study culture industry, we would want to know, uh, measure it or talk about its scale or maybe do a study and ask people what kind of clothes they do they like to wear. But we won't go into the actual workings of the culture industry. The other part of the culture industry is that it is for profit. Traditionally, again, in pre-modern society, in pre-capitalist society, culture was rarely for profit. Like many other things were not for profit, culture was rarely for profit. You may have had certain kind of patronage by the ruling sections of society in feudalism. You may patronage a particular kind of weaving, particular kind of uh, painting, particular kind of designing, uh, which would be patronized. But it would not be mass production and it would not be for profit. Whereas today we have a mass culture which increasingly gears us to become identical. Movies and radio, very interestingly, remember these were being written, these texts of Adorno or Horkheimer were being written in the first part of the 20th century, in the f first you know, 30, 40, 50 years of the 20th century. And at that point, in the West, you already had mass media in the sense of movies and radio, which in their part of the world, he says, no longer pretend to be art. This is business. This is what we call uh, business. In our, in our part of the world, in India in particular, we did not have that same kind of the growth of the mass media as they witnessed. Therefore, it becomes even more important in sociology syllabus, whether you become a policymaker or a bureaucrat or a teacher or a critical commentator or a journalist, to know about these critical theorists. Because it impinges on our lives today as we live in the second quarter of the 21st century in India. That the media or the entertainment industry or the culture industry is an industry for business, is an industry for profit. And that very often, however, we do not look into those aspects. But if we sort of start exploring critically, for example, uh, sometimes we look at it, we know about it, but we don't explore it further. Say, the kind of profit which maybe the producer of a film makes. Maybe the kind of profit uh, which the owner of a television channel makes. 
you know, that is the kind of profit which a director's income is. It has no bearing with actual questions of culture as was traditionally understood. It is business with a big B. And therefore, nowadays, when we have a kind of annual report of the media industry, the first thing that they are there in the data is the whole question about how, how much profit does it get generated. Many of you would have heard this, top, uh, this particular term, revenue model, the revenue model which exists, that can we have a newspaper which is not viable for profit? Can we have a television channel which is not viable for profit? And if you're not viable for profit, it shuts down. Traditionally, we thought this was probably true of other industries, but the fact that it is true of the culture industry comes home to us much more, much more sharply in the contemporary, industry, uh, contemporary period because the media industry has become enormously huge in India. So the first point that we looked at is homogenization. The second point that we looked at is profit. Now, the third point that we're looking at is technology. The technology has become huge. Uh, you are aware of a particular point of time where we did not have the kind of news that we have today. We have news with multiple people participating, debates which are online. We have visuals which are fantastic. We have all kinds of photography. We have audio. And we have, even as the news is being read out, you have online polls. Uh, you have, apparently, there is a kind of technology which makes everybody feel that they're engaged, that they're participating, that they have greater freedom, that they greater have greater choice. Adorno and Horkheimer, however, felt even at that period of time that this is, in a certain sense, something which is misleading because this technology appears to be neutral. And their argument is that there is a certain logic in this technology which transforms public discourse, which makes this technology demand certain kind of organization, planning and management. It transforms the nature of culture itself. And if culture is understood at one point of time as being something which is spontaneous, creative, individualistic, increasingly becomes something which is mass, homogeneous, organized, planned, and management. I'll give you probably a very simple kind of example that you are familiar with, say, with television channels, and you know about soap opera, opera uh, uh, you know, soaps which come on televisions, or what are called popular serials. Now, very often you have heard this word TRP, that is, they do market research to find how popular a particular program is. And depending upon them, you would have the advertisements putting in more greater and greater money. Very often, the argument put forward is that we produce what people want to hear. We produce what people want to see, what consumers want to see, which again leads us to the point that are our desires or our needs or our tastes something which is natural or are our tastes something which is changing? Are our tastes something which are constructed by the media itself or by the culture industry itself? And here again, the critical theories go in to more complicated idea about homogeneity in one hand and differentiation on the other. What do I mean by this whole question of homogeneity and differentiation? That as we become more and more similar in our ways, in the, world, in the cultural pro products that we use, in the cultural modes that we do, there is an attempt by the cultural industry to make us more and more unique. So they would say that, look, they'll have categories. Any of you who've worked in an advertisement um, you know, set up, you'll be aware that they will categorize people, that this kind of people like to dress like this. They will say that you are unique even as they sell a particular kind of product. So there is a certain kind of contradiction that as people want to look more and more individualistic, actually we start looking more and more similar. It becomes very 
very difficult to make out different kinds of style. People will have similar haircuts, similar kind of clothes and at the same time the rhetoric or the ideas which will be promoted is individualism, is greater choice, greater freedom to do whatever you wish to. So here is a peculiar situation of apparent greater freedom to do as you wish but on the other what the critical theorists are that behind this freedom is a great cultural industry which is making your freedom more and more restricted. So the choice that is being put forward by the cultural industry or advertisements in specific is that do you want this kind of refrigerator or do you want that kind of refrigerator? Do you want this kind of car or do you want that kind of car? Do you want this kind of laptop or do you want to have that kind of laptop? But the argument that the critical theorists would say that your choice then gets restricted within the laptops or within the refrigerators itself. You don't ask questions which are outside the paradigm or outside the framework that the cultural industry has put on you. Related to this question of choice and freedom, they go into the whole question about certain new myths which are created. For example, they say that traditionally we had an idea that you would maybe have fairy tale movies or fairy tale serials where you may have a poor person who suddenly becomes very rich. And they say that in the modern world, it would be very, very difficult for people to believe that it is actually possible for somebody who is extremely poor to become extremely rich and that it's a question of chance. Taking this question of chance, the critical theorists argue that the culture industry has in fact even harnessed this idea about chance. And in this context, what is very important, they talk about talent scouts. Now, in our country, the whole question of talent scouts is something which is very, very new. You are familiar with the, you know, the talent scout competition which takes place for music, for dance, for certain kind of abilities which were not there before. And here, the argument could be that you may have somebody who comes from a very ordinary background who then suddenly is given maybe a cruise to travel, maybe lacks to make. And so there is this element by which the culture industry is deciding on the aspirations that you have, on the aspirations that you have, and make it seem much more feasible. Though it is probably true that a lot of them people who do not actually move on in society or become more mobile in society. So if when I give you this example, and maybe in newspapers you have heard of cases where people actually won particular competition in one of these talent scouts and they never made it big. And very often they got used to a certain lifestyle and may have moved in directions which not would be antisocial or probably even criminal. Therefore, in this description, perhaps, you will understand what they meant by the culture industry, something which ought to be creative and spontaneous and individual, now become mass, profit-based, and large-scale and homogeneous. Enlightenment is mass deception. Apparently, we are much more free, much more sovereign. But on the other hand, we are in what contemporary words is called a mediatized discourse that we are rarely ever able to explain uh, you know, uh, anything even in our own language. Very often I hear words which are used in the media or which are used in the corporate becoming words which we use in our everyday life, including the academia. So in the academia today, if you want to write a research project, they will try to ask you what will be the deliverables of your research project, which is a concept which is borrowed from the corporate sector. If you talk in a fashion where you take knowledge as given and not related, you will take that as given and not ask that why do we have to do it. But if you are inspired by the critical theorists or the critical perspective, then you will ask 
Why is why has this word become a buzzword today? Why is this concept brand making a word today and was not a word another time? And if you start asking questions like that, you would have been truly inspired by a critical perspective and go back to a sociological perspective, to go back to our early class which asks questions which are complicated, which are difficult and does not accept knowledge as a taken for granted. Thank you very much. Um, Ma'am, uh, in this context of this lecture, what do you think is the relevance of critical theory in contemporary times? Yeah, I would. I'm very happy that you asked this question, because ironically, in many of our syllabus in sociology, in many parts, critical theory is not there. Whereas maybe they're still teaching Talcott Parsons, which may not be so relevant today in our contemporary context. In the, they were, uh, you know, there are two points I want to make. One, that the critical theorists were writing in the early part of the 20th century, primarily post-World War II in Europe. The issues that they raised then in the West may not have been relevant in the Indian context then. Because 1947, we became independent. We were an extremely poor country. Affluence was not part of our lives, except for a very restricted elite section of people. In fact, even our plan policies would say that we want growth with equity. We there was more emphasis on distribution. It was a developmental model which was very different from the developmental model of a consumer society which became important in the West at that point of time. Ironically, so many years later, almost 50 years later, many of the issues that they raised are relevant here today. 1991, India became liberalized. Prior to that, we only heard stories about how in the United States of America, you had so many channels. Hmm. In our country, we just had Doordarshan. And for my generation, we didn't even have television when we were growing up, right? So you had an idea that now there'll be so much more freedom. That look, earlier we only heard Doordarshan or All India Radio. And now we can have so many radio channels and we now can hear so many televisions, okay? So we are more free. The critical theorist told us, take this idea of freedom with great care. Because you may not be so free. And I'm sure all of us here would know when we sit with our remote, apparently so much in control. And if we shift from one channel to the other, it's not very different. Mm. If you look through the soaps, if they're right now in our serials, I don't know about other languages and Hindi languages, Nagin is in fashion. So every now and then you have the heroine who becomes a Nagin or the Nagin comes in, which is that they would argue that there's a demand for Nagin. That is the industry feels it will sell better. Mm -hmm. Now again, notice critical theorist idea of the culture industry being a business industry of a profit. Jo Nagin ne dekhayenge, wo flop show ho jayenge and you cannot have a flop show because the culture industry is a big, uh, industry for profit. They no longer call uh, uh, you know, news as news, but they call it infotainment. Mm -hmm. okay? So when you have into entertainment, then you move away from the idea of the media being as a fourth pillar of democracy, which makes you more informed. Today we have something which the critical theorists did not anticipate, fake news. Mm -hmm. We have technology which they anticipated, but they did not anticipate bots in social media, uh, you know, that we have, in fact, I'm absolutely amazed as how relevant they are today because they had anticipated the way the technology is no longer neutral. It can be manipulated and yet there's an overall feeling that we know so much, you know, that all of us, particularly, unfortunately, the educated section, they feel so informed. So often I watch on television, people will say that, look, you know, we are educated, we are middle class, hume to pata hai. but those who are poor don't know. That is actually uncritical knowledge. Very often, the middle class educated people have more ideological biases. We actually know less about the others than people who are in more marginalized sections of society. Because we are in a comfort zone. We don't need to know others. Like during British colonialism, the British may not know so much about us, but we knew mm. about them because we knew that they would be better not tell them this. 
okay mm. so when you are in power or when you are more dominant we actually know less and we know less particularly because our education has become so rote based mm. two mark four mark six marks ab ye words use de dijiye aapko marks mil jayenge that is the kind of critique which the critical a theorists were arguing so they are relevant for a mediatized world they are relevant for a rote based education world they are relevant for a newspaper industry or television industry or the internet now uh, where you increasingly have a certain uncritical 24/7 breaking news culture so i think uh, i'd stop over here but basically i think their relevance today is phenomenal if you have any other question or more ma'am just a, uh, just a supplementary to this uh, critical theory was essentially a western concept developed in western mm-hmm. world uh, how do you see its relevance say particularly in the case of india yeah because we are in a different context we are in a different culture setup to per se so how do you see it's 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 uh, it's co- connection with india in that sense yeah thank you very much for asking this question because this question is not only relevant for critical theorists but in a certain sense relevant for all western theorists which form a bulk of uh, what we teach uh, mm. in sociology or any social sciences and i think what has to be important is how do we define the west and how do we define india as mm. the non west is there a cultural essence like very often we say look our family uh, system is so different from their family system you know we they will say look they never had arranged marriages and we had arranged marriages the kind of common sensical discussion that we have but if you look at historically from a critical theorist perspective you would notice that uh, if you look at novels say pride and prejudice or any of the old uh, novels which were based in pre capitalist uh, europe they also had arranged marriages they also had uncles and aunts grandfathers grandmothers so was that something specific to the west and non west or was it historical specificity that is one reason the second is that we have to accept whether we like it or not that we were colonized and that today most most of the world uh, across the world why most all the world is uh, you know capitalist in a certain sense of the time a market economy our media industry operates on those grounds so what is our problem to teach culture industry or critical theorists when we can have american idol and an indian idol we can have franchise which is global and which is franchise which is local we can have mcdonald and we can have you know that we cannot deny it. and the critical theorists would say that we should operate not with the ideas that we have about who we are what we are but what exists in reality what exists outside you know so if we i'm using a smartphone or we having satellite television and say look i don't like this technology it won't help mm. what would be more important to say is this technology equal are able are people able to access it equally mm. and even more important according to the critical theorists not just access everybody can access a smartphone everybody can access google you know mm. but nowadays we have fake news like a uh, uber uh, driver the other day told me that actually nehru was not the first prime minister and patel was so i said how did you know he said google kya now what happens here the critical theorists become very very Uh, important because they tell us that don't take any information as taken for granted we have to learn to see things dialectical i should ask oh he's wrong that is not my response as a critical theorist i should say why does he think so and when we google there are 50 things when we google something are our students learning which site to google and how to google that should be the perspective of a critical uh, theorist perspective okay. thank you very thank much you. dear friends we have tried to understand critical theory in this lecture and on that note we would like to thank professor chaudhry for coming thank you here very much, and delivering yeah. this wonderful lecture and thank you dear friends for watching our lecture stay tuned and keep watching thank you